architect Divya Chakravarti. She completed her undergraduate studies from SRM University and she went on to pursue her masters in historic preservation and urbanism and study of the built environment from the University of California, Los Angeles. She went on to work for the Department of Planning and Preservation for the city of Pasadena, California. She also did a brief stint of work for Historic Scotland, Edinburgh, UK. She also worked on conservation projects like Kalsa Mahal, Gokhale Hall in Chennai and Marimala Park Educational Trust in Mysore. She is currently working as a director of Samrakshan Heritage Consultancy. She is also a co-founder of the Artisan Reprisal of Traditional Materials. method and technology she goes on to conduct workshops to revive traditional and lost methods of construction welcome to the ugc lecture series for bachelors of architecture the subject we are discussing is environmental science the topic we'll be delving into is environmental pollution in this lecture we'll be looking into solid waste management role of an individual to curb pollution pollution case studies and disaster management plan now the best way we can actually get our management for solid waste is to create something useful possible from that waste so the concept of best from waste came into being and the concept of laying a plastic road was one of the best options that came up from reusing plastics because in today's world one of the new materials that has emerged is the use of plastics which is pretty much become unavoidable let it be plastic bottles bags covers innumerable kinds of packaging material disposable material it's all forms of plastic and styrofoam which necessarily cannot be recycled in a 100% pure form so the next best way is to actually go about laying a road It is found that with increase in global population and the rising demand for food and other essentials there has been a rise in the amount of waste also that is being generated every day by each household so or you can count the number of households that are increasing in each city and that pretty much gets multiplied by so many thousands hundreds of thousands or lakhs waste that is not properly managed especially excreta and other liquid and solid waste from households as well as the community can cause a serious health hazard and lead to the spread of various infectious diseases role of an individual to prevent pollution who introduced these contaminants into the natural environment it is answer is very obvious it is us humans so to find a solution also rests with us this could simply lead to the end of everything in the sense we might be responsible for all these effects but the the damage is not only felt by humans in the longer run but is immediately felt by plant life other ecological life which is eventually going to harm us in the longer run if there is a problem obviously there should be a solution and obviously for full pollution there are various solutions but how feasible are these solutions how well can these solutions be maintained in terms of how frequently will human beings follow them or how frequently will we break the rules so these solutions are just not in paper format for us to read but it has to come to a phase where we are going to incorporate it in our day to day lives prevention is obviously better than cure so to essentially win the race against pollution all of us have a role to play it's very easy to say what can i do if i make a change how is it going to make a difference but when it's an entire community we are talking about an entire society we are talking about so many eyes do make a difference it is only when we behave in a certain way that our children will also learn to behave like that when we stop littering our roads and our public environment will they learn that littering is wrong if we heal the earth we automatically ensure that we heal ourselves and we are also ensuring that our progeny our children and their children will continue to lead a very healthy life 
as an individual what is our contributions stop smoking or at least follow the no smoking sign so where smoking is not permitted we have to strictly follow it use unleaded gasoline in all your cars keep properly maintained to keep it in good running condition to avoid smoke emissions share a ride or engage in carpooling instead of using your cars choose to walk or ride a bicycle whenever possible with this eco friendly practice you will also be healthier and happier by staying fit never use open fires to dispose of waste adopt the 3 hours of solid waste management reduce consumption reuse whenever possible and recycle whenever possible inorganic materials such as metals glass and plastic also organic materials like paper can be reclaimed and recycled start composting brown leaves in your yard and green scraps from your kitchen any wet waste from the kitchen can be added to the compost this will not only reduce the waste in the landfill but it will also help in improving soil conditions home gardens as well as the quality of the garden right outside your house reconnect with nature live green by using green power supplied abundantly and freely by the wind and the sun hang your laundry to dry to minimize use of gas or electricity from your dryers enjoy fresh air from open windows to lessen the use of air conditioning systems say a very big no to gmos or genetically modified organisms where especially for farmers when they have to choose seeds or saplings genetically engineered crops are not only very bad for the environment since they require massive amounts of fungicides pesticides and herbicides but they also these altered foods are a big risk towards health and can negatively impact farmers livelihood use eco friendly or biodegradable materials instead of plastic which are made of highly toxic substances injurious to our health create your own green space value your garden and it doesn't have to be an independent bungalow for you to have a garden even if it's a small balcony having a few pots does help in keeping the air fresh in your own homes you need to plant more trees make sure there are indoor plants in your homes they clean the air provide oxygen and also beautify your surroundings thus care for them and by protecting them especially the big trees around in the forest we not only protect ourselves or our immediate family but the families to come in the future generations as well industries should use fuel with lower sulfur content industries should monitor their air emissions regularly and take measures to ensure compliance with the prescribed emission standards install gobar gas or biogas plants in areas of high availability of cow dung especially in rural areas they can be a good substitute for cooking gas or even providing forms of electricity one person alone cannot save the planet's biodiversity but each individual's effort to encourage nature's wealth must never be underestimated this is one of the goals of the united nations environment program moving on to disaster management anything which causes disruption could be induced a situation after severe transformation of ecological response so this consists of the different aspects of disaster management that we will be discussing what is disaster an event which could either be natural or man made sudden or progressive which impacts with such severity that the community has to respond taking exceptional measures it is a phenomenon involving extensive ecological disruption leading risk to life property health to an extent warranting extraordinary response from outside the affected area enormous population pressures and urbanization a flood a drought or an earthquake millions of people are affected each time such a disaster occurs depending on the frequency of disaster 
the concentration of disaster, the area it has attacked as well as the frequency it comes in. Is it going to be a very frequent episode? Is it going to be a very concentrated episode of higher magnitude? All of this is an important factor. Large scale displacement and the loss of life, loss of property as well as agricultural crops. The reasons for these are varied. You have an increasing population pressure in urban areas. There is an increase in the extent of encroachment into land. So riverbeds and drainage courses and low lying areas are increasing. Poor or ignored zoning laws and policies. Lack of proper risk management or insurance. Major disasters in India. It's a highly disaster prone country. Eight natural calamities per year is our new frequency. Five fold increase in the frequency of disasters in the last three decades. Bhopal gas tragedy. Cyclones which frequent Andhra Pradesh and Orissa. Earthquake in Uttarakshi in 1990. Latur in 93. Gujarat 2001 and Sikkim in 2011. Tsunami that hit us in 2004 frequent train accidents and bomb blasts in Delhi and Mumbai. India's vulnerability to disasters. 57% of the land is vulnerable to earthquakes. Of this, 12% is vulnerable to severe earthquakes. 12% is considered to be in the extra danger zone. 68% of the land is vulnerable to drought. 12% is vulnerable to floods. 8% land is vulnerable to cyclones. Apart from natural disasters, some cities in India are also vulnerable to chemical and industrial disasters and man-made disasters. If you look at the different types of disasters, we have natural as well as man-made. Under the natural, you have cyclones, floods, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, epidemics, tsunamis. And man-made, you have air crashes, sinking ships, train accidents, building collapse, bridge collapse, bomb blasts, warfare. But certain percentage of natural disasters could be an after effect of some man-made or human-induced activity. For instance, the landslide could be because of constant soil erosion and constant deforestation in a particular area because of human intervention. Even though the final product of a landslide is a natural calamity or a natural disaster, it has eventually been caused by human beings. Factors affecting disaster. The host factors are age, immunization status, degree of mobility, emotional stability. Environmental factors are physical factors, chemical factors, biological factors, social and psychological factors. Characteristic of disasters, predictability, controllability, speed of onset, length of forewarning, duration of impact, scope and intensity of impact. If you look at the disaster cycle, first we have the impact, the disaster surrounded by what is the main impact that is felt, the immediate response that is felt or response that is coming from the people around the area of the disaster, recovery, final outcome when everything settles down where you see what is the final loss in terms of property, life and landscape, then comes to create a prevention measures. Okay, what shall we do to prevent this from happening the second time? And if it cannot be prevented, that is it cannot be looked forward to or it cannot be predicted, how can the impact be reduced to a certain extent? And how can we prepare ourselves and prepare the general public so that next time when the impact is felt, the response and recovery is faster and it is we are prepared for it such that, that the final outcome or the damage that is seen is minimal. Phases of disaster management, disaster preparedness, disaster impact, disaster response, rehabilitation and disaster mitigation. If you look at phases of disaster, you have a pre-disaster which needn't always be there. It is only now that with the technology that you have certain amount of pre-disaster timings or you have the weather board coming and informing us that there is a threat for a flood, there is a threat for heavy rains 
or a tsunami could be warned or an earthquake is very rarely predicted these days. So, the pre-disaster is very rare, then you have the dip or the final impact and then use the fast recovery speed which is the honeymoon phase or the community cohesion where everything is going well because the immediate thing is to help human beings. It is the heroic phase where the main aim is to save everyone and save everything. And then there is a plummeting disillusionment in terms of as things are settling into place, we finally look around us and see what is the loss that is felt around us, what is the loss that is there within our homes, within communities, within building societies, within the built landscape, built environment, etc. Then there is a steady growth process, there are certain trigger events and anniversary reactions and this takes one to three years. This immediate thing could happen within a week span, three to four days is what we are talking about from the day of impact to the immediate recovery phase. But then when you come up with a long term plan, how do you go about ensuring that people are getting resettled, all of that could take anywhere from one to three years and that is the beginning of a reconstruction or a new beginning depending on the um, magnitude of the disaster and the frequency of the disaster. If you look at the disaster management over here, you have pre-hospital, initial phase could be planning if you look at it, but suppose we are not at all aware of it and this is the first disaster that is hitting, pre-hospital will be the first, then the hospital off, when they come off the hospital is there going to be a second home or a second base camp of sorts and then how do we plan to ensure that our hospitals are going to be equipped for such disasters, our doctors and nursing community is going to be equipped for such disasters. So this planning and pre-hospital could be first depending on the which number disaster this is. If it is the first time it is attacking, we are not going to have any planning involved and it is better to even have a planning in place, disaster management plan has to be in place for all cities irrespective of the fact that they have faced a disaster or not. Because when we have a plan of action in our hand, the reaction time is much faster and swifter as well. If you look at the planning phase of disaster management, it is prediction, prevention and then preparing the public. And then if you look at the operation phase of it, it is rescue, relief and rehabilitation. First, our aim should be to predict with the current trends in growth of science and technology, how possible is it to predict any number of the disasters that we have. Man-made disasters are slightly more difficult to predict, but they can be avoided. Say for uh, instance, if we are just careful, if we are main ensuring that all the engines of flights, trains, cars, everything is going to be checked, public transport, buses are checked, all of these are in the predict and prevent action. It could be let it be man-made or even natural disasters. Natural disasters can be predicted means certain amount of evacuation plans can be in place. The damage of things and landscapes sometimes cannot be avoided but at least loss of life of animals and human beings can be reduced or minimized. So in the prevent section, it's very cru crucial that we ensure that man-made disasters are something that we look out for and minimize. And finally, how do we go about preparing ourselves, preparing the community at large and the rescue mission services? How do we ensure to prepare them that such that their reaction time is swift and they can solve all the issues that come into hand when the impact is felt right away and graciously. Principles of disaster management. Disaster management is the responsibility of all spheres of government. They should use resources that exist for day to day purpose. Organizations should function as an extension of their core business. Individuals are responsible for their own safety. Disaster management planning should focus on large scale events. DM planning should recognize the difference between incidents and disasters. They should also take into account the type of physical environment and the structure of population that exists in that particular area. The arrangements must recognize the involvement and potential role 
of non-governmental agencies. In, under the prediction factor, what are the steps that can be taken? Measures for efficient forecasting and warning systems, developing GIS for early detection and warning, information technology for effective communication network, proactive measures for disaster preparedness and mitigation, administrative, financial, legislative and techno, that is techno legal, developing public awareness to build up society strength to face disasters, national networking for immediate medical response, emphasis on risk reduction, mitigation and awareness while strengthening the response. The steps towards prevention, we need to evoke certain existing systems of response mechanism in the wake of any natural or man-made disaster at all levels of government and steps to minimize the response time to, through effective communication and make sure that the measures to ed ensure adequacy of relief operations throughout equally irrespective of social backgrounds or economic backgrounds. Develop strategies for inclusion of disaster reduction components in ongoing plan or non-plan schemes. Prepare the community to face the challenge and respond in case of impending disaster. Lay stress on preparedness including prevention, mitigation of chemical industrial disasters while strengthening their emergency response. Stay up to date with the latest international best practices and recent developments within the country. Highlight the salient gaps evaluated based upon the critical review of the present status for the future action. Rehabilitation involves providing temporary shelters with minimum hygiene sanitation that is going to be affected, restoring normalcy through ensuring resumption of families' everyday living patterns to the maximum possible, psychological impact of chemical disaster manifested as PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorders in displaced people due to disaster, needs need to be care taken care by psychologists and psychiatrists as well. In post-disaster scenarios, some of the casualties will develop sequel due to chemical or radiation injuries. These cases may need frequent regular follow-ups, medical care, reconstructive surgery as well as rehabilitation. Close monitoring is obviously very crucial to ensure that long-term health effects like blindness, intestinal lung fibrosis and neurological deficiencies and they need to be treated as well and recorded to ensure that we are prepared for such events in the future as well. Disaster response, epidemiologic surveillance and disease control, vaccination, nutrition. Rehabilitation phase, we need to ensure it does not affect water supply, food safety, basic sanitation and personal hygiene, vector control. Disaster effects are typically death, disability, increase in communicable diseases, psychological problems, shortage of food, socio-economic losses, shortage of drugs and medical supplies, environmental disruption. The disaster recovery phase is ensured by successful recovery preparation. We need to be vigilant in health teaching, psychological support that needs to be offered, reference to hospital as and when needed, especially for specializations. You need to remain alert for environmental health. Nurses must be attentive to danger and they should keep across a list of symptoms that need to be looked upon for. The main areas of concern, activation of an early warning system network and its close monitoring, mechanisms for integrating scientific, technological and administrative agencies for effective disaster management, terrestrial communication links which collapse in the event of a rapid onset disaster, vulnerability of critical infrastructures, power supply, communication, water supply, transport, etc and ensuring such facilities reach disaster events. Funding. Primary relief has to be very important. That is the first disaster response. Preparedness and mitigation is very often ignored. 
lack of integrated efforts to collect and compile data, information and local knowledge on disaster history and traditional response patterns, need for standardized efforts in compiling and interpreting geospatial data, satellite imagery and early warning signals. Weak areas continue to be forecasting, modeling, risk prediction, simulation and scenario analysis. Absence of a national level, state level and district level directory of experts and inventory of resources. Absence of a national disaster management plan and state level and district level disaster management plans. Sustainability of efforts, effective interagency coordination and standard operating procedures for stakeholder groups, especially critical first responder agencies, emergency medicine, critical care medicine, triage, first acid, first aid. Nodal agencies for disaster management, the floods, we have the Ministry of Water Resources, and then for cyclones, you have Indian Meteorological Department. Earthquakes, the agency involved is Indian Meteorological Department again. Epidemics is Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Avian Flu, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Environment. Ministry of Agriculture as well as Animal Husbandry. So all of these agencies have to be in contact with each other because any of these disasters could be an after effect of a previous disaster as well. For instance, soon after floods, because of stagnant water everywhere, there could be a source of cre creation of mosquitoes as well as other epidemic related issues. So then the Ministry of Health as well as the Ministry of Water Resources have to have a coordinated combined effort to ensure good satisfactory relief. For other chemical disasters, we have the Ministry of Environment and Forests. Industrial disasters, we have Ministry of Labor. Rail accidents, Ministry of Railways. Air accidents is Civil Aviation. Fire, Ministry of Home Affairs. Nuclear incidents is Department of Atomic Energy. Mine disasters is Department of Mines. New directions for disaster management in India. The National Disaster Management Authority has been set up as the apex body for disaster management in India with the Prime Minister as its chairman. Disaster management authorities will set up at the state district levels which, to be, uh, which are to be headed by the chief ministers, collectors, the Jilla Parishad chairman respectively. A national disaster mitigation fund will be administered by the NDMA. Then you have a response fund will also be administered by them and they will decide through different state administrating funds and disaster bodies that which level of disaster, how much of funds will be required. Eight battalions of National Disaster Response Force or NDRF will be trained and deployed with CSIR. A national disaster management policy a national disaster response plan will also be drawn up. At the end of this lecture, we have looked into solid waste management, role of an individual to curb pollution, disaster management plan, importance of mitigation and preparedness. At the end of the lecture, we should be able to answer the following questions. Give an example where waste can be converted to a useful product. How can an individual in his day-to-day -day activities help reduce pollution? Define disaster. What is disaster management? This brings us to the end of this lecture. Thank you.